All right, so welcome. Welcome to From Was Zero to Was Hero, an introduction to Was Zero for gophers and other species. Um, just in case that you didn't know, uh, you would be getting a lot of Was Zero even if you were, weren't in this session because for one reason or another, these people are using Was Zero. Um, and uh, we're pretty close to reaching 4K stars, so uh, you have the power and <laughs> I trust you to do the right thing. Eternal happiness is just a star away. Um, anyway, who the hell am I? Uh, my name is Eduardo Vacchi. I did a bunch of things before this, but uh, now I work at Tetrid, a service mesh company, and uh, it's also an open source company. Um, there's a few projects that they support, and one of them is Wazero. So I'm gonna talk about that, obviously, today. Uh, also, I'm a Golang noob, so if I say something uh, wrong, uh, please bear with me or correct me, I'm fine. Um, I'm gonna give you an introduction to the Go ecosystem for people that may not be completely um, familiar with it and the challenges that are uh, peculiar to that ecosystem, but this is not necessarily a talk about Go. You can probably uh, take a lot of um, uh, you know, ideas, and, uh, um, if, especially if you're a maintainer of, uh, of a runtime. I'm gonna give an introduction to Wazero and then explain how Wazero is being used and how Wazero is implemented in some of its parts. And finally, um, some lessons that we learn along the way. So, if I had to say uh, three features that are peculiar and uh, um, characterizing of Go are uh, static linking, cross compilation, and Go routines. All these things are kind of defining for the Go ecosystem, the reasons of the success. So you can build your static executable, deploy it pretty much everywhere. You can cross compile, so you can compile, uh, I don't know, on my M1 uh, ARM64, I can compile for Windows x86. That's pretty cool. And Go routines for easy uh, easy uh, concurrency. So that's pretty cool, but however, these come with some drawbacks. Uh, if you're doing static linking, it's uh, more complicated to do dynamic code logging. Uh, well, it's actually kind of impossible, but you can actually do it somehow. Um, and uh, cross compilation depends on the Go tool chain. That's not an issue per se. Uh, Go routines and abstraction over OS threads. The reason why I'm marking these are uh, drawbacks, I'm gonna explain a little bit. That's the, the issue, pretty much. So uh, every language run to, every language has a form of foreign function interface to interface with general native code or C code. Uh, here on Putty, uh, I put C and C++, Rust and Zig as an uh, you know example languages that compile uh, to uh, C compatible uh, interface. And when you have to in to interface with these languages, you have to abide to the rules of these languages. So, for instance, in Python, you have C types. In Java, you have JNI. Um, you have libffi that works with a bunch of other languages. And in Go, you have Cgo. So, what's the problem with Cgo? Well, there's not a lot of problems, especially if you're just supporting one platform. Like, if you're supporting just Linux and Ubuntu, uh, that's, gonna be, that's gonna be a big deal. But if you're supporting other platforms, that was already uh, one of the issues uh, that you might encounter. Like. Um, you no longer can trust, I mean, the, you, you no longer can just trust the compiler to compile for any uh, platform that is out there because it now relies on the um, presence of a C compiler on your platform. And as you might know, um, cross compilation using the C tool chain is kind of painful, or it used to be. Um, there are also tooling issues. So the tools that you're familiar with, profilers, debuggers, um, now do not really work well with the native bit of code that you're linking against because it's, a, it's an opaque uh, kind of binary and you cannot really introspect. Runtime issues. As I mentioned, Go routines are pretty cool, but they work because the runtime is aware of them. Uh, as soon as you run foreign code, that it's uh, native code that is not aware of the presence of the routines, basically the, the, the runtime has to give up. And it has to give up an entire thread and devote it basically to, to, to that routine that you're, that you're running. So they do not play well together. There are also performance issues and security issues. Let me explain those in more detail. So there's this old issue on the Go GitHub repo uh, that uh, it's, it's from 2017 and it, and it speaks about performance problems with Seago. Um, things have changed over the years, but this is a very recent, blo recent blog post uh, from last week. Um, and it still discuss, uh, discusses uh, performance of uh, Cgo. Uh, the too long didn't read version is, it's not as low as you would think, so things have improved over the years, but it's not for free. So it's still, 
uh, it's still a boundary that you have to cross. Now let's see uh, other issues. Um, uh, is isolation, isolation security and safety issues. So suppose that you have your routine compiled using Rust and your routine compiled using another routine compiled using Zig and you want to call them. Now this is in a way, the way your memory will kind of look like, and this can be the, the mental model that you can use. So everything is mixed up. There's no real boundary between the memory that is being allocated with Zig, the memory that Go is using, the memory that, 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 that Rust is using. Um, so what you really would like to have, especially if you're running foreign code, and especially if this is user-written code for extensions, is something more neat like this. You want your, uh, the memory of your, of your host uh, or your guest code um, of your extensions to be um, neatly isolated this way. So that's how um, kind of works with, uh, with, with, um, with zero and in particular with WebAssembly in particular with was zero. This is an old talk from uh, the Takeshi wrote and presented GoForCon Go 2022. The APIs have changed a little bit, but that's, a, that's the same uh, concept anyway. You have a byte slice, it is a byte array, and your memory is all confined in that space for, uh, for Rust and for Zig. There's also the other property that you must be uh, familiar with, um, WebAssembly, where um, only host functions that you explicitly expose are available to the guest. So, uh, the zig function cannot just call any function. Only the function are made explicitly available to it will be invocable. And it is the, in this example, we're invoking OS primitives. Um, only those OS primitives that are making explicitly available will be available to the guest. So that's a way to isolate, make it more secure. And um, in turn, this is a way to break the monolith, that is break uh, the statically linked uh, executables. This is another talk from another colleague of mine, Adrian Cole. Um, this is an example where Dapper, which is um, you know a way to do um, uh, sidecars and uh, and uh, and uh, middleware um, in, the, in the cloud, uh, now provides through Wazero a way to write your own HTTP filters using WebAssembly. So instead of having other microservices connecting to the sidecar, you can run the WebAssembly HTTP filter di directly in the core with a lot of benefits. And it's using this HTTP WASM ABI which is similar conceptually to WASI HTTP, but it predates that. So um, before was zero, all of the WASM runtimes that were available required CGO. So all of those downsides that I've explained uh, were there. So was zero was uh, implemented to support uh, Go developers um, in a way that's more convenient for them. And it's, uh, it, the name is zero, was zero, that zero stands for zero dependency. This means uh, both that we do not depend on CGO extensions and that, uh, in general, we do not use any, any other uh, third-party dependency. So it was funded, and it was originally developed in 2020 as a side project uh, that Takeshi developed. Um, and in 2021, uh, Tetra decided to sponsor it uh, with, uh, as a top-level project. There's three full-time developers, and there's also two external committee, uh, the committers, um, contributing. And of course, we also welcome any external contribution. Um, with zero avoid CGO uh, entirely, and in the rest of the talk, I'm going to show you a few of the techniques that we're using to do that. Uh, so by, uh, so that these are the premises, and this, this is the, uh, you know, the, the, the things that we do. And this way, you can still have static linking, but you are able to do dynamic code loading by loading WASM. You can still use cross compilation because you're still using the regular uh, traditional Go tool chain. We are not using CGO, so you can still cross compile. And Go routines works the way you expect. What I mean when I say Go, uh, Go routines work the way you expect. Well, for instance, um, when you're using Go, you would expect uh, your Go routines to integrate uh, with the context pattern, which is part of the standard library. It's, using, uh, it's used throughout all the standard library enterprise party libraries. So you can cancel a context. Um, the context is being threaded through all the cold chain, and this is a way to terminate uh, an execution, abort an execution, and this integrates neatly in Wazero so that you can abort the execution of a long-running uh, WebAssembly routine. This is simply uh, not, not, I don't know if it's possible, but in general it's very complicated to do with a native, native code. And so this is another way we uh, cater for our Go users. Oracle things that we support, um, Again, we support cross-compilation and we leverage the Go compiler for that. 
and we try, we, 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 we strive to make sure that we, um, uh, we are able to cross-compile in as many, um, as many platforms as possible. Most of the platforms are already supported by the Go compiler. So even um, fancy, uh, fancy platforms such as FreeBSD, which is not particularly exotic, but even Plan 9, because why not? And if, you know, unless you're not familiar with the logo, the Gopher logo uh, originates from the Plan 9 logo. Uh, when uh, Rob Pike, who's one of the creator of language, is also one of the creator of Plan 9. So that's not by mistake. And you can also do fancier stuff. Like, you can compile with zero in WebAssembly. And then you can run the WebAssembly version of with zero in interpreter mode, and then run Doom compiled in with zero. And then so you can run your wazir in your wazir, so you can wasm while you wasm. And um, so this is an example of running a Doom, uh, WebAssembly Doom uh, version that renders in ASCII art, and it all works. So that's pretty impressive. <laughs> it didn't require any other change besides actually making sure that cross-compilation worked. So I didn't do anything particular here. Actually, most of the work Adrian did. Um, there are a few uh, projects in the cloud native ecosystem that are already using Wazir in some form or, or, or another. Dapper, as I already mentioned, Mozen is an HTTP proxy, just like Envoy, but it's all written in Go. Uh, Trivi is a security scanner is using Wazir uh, to load dynamically WebAssembly uh, definition for, for scanning. Um, Kubernetes, is, this is still a work in progress. It's incubating a way to write custom schedulers um, using WebAssembly, and it's using Wazir under the hood. Oh, and uh, if you are one user and you have a use case or you know people, you can have more use cases at that page at the bottom. Just open up here. So the main use case for WebAssembly uh, and Wazero is to do plugins and extensions. Uh, from another point of view, what, what kind of uh, compilers and flavors of the compiler are available to compile to WebAssembly? Well, there's TinyGo, probably you're familiar with it. It was probably the first to support YZ Preview 1. Uh, but nowadays, even uh, the, the proper Go toolchain supports WASI, um, and that's the way I compile with zero um, in WebAssembly. And this is starting from Go 121, which is just released last month. So let's see how with zero actually works. With zero is a Go runtime for WebAssembly, of course, and uh, it implements an interpreter. So there's both an interpreter mode and a compiler mode. I, men I mentioned the interpreter mode. Uh, in, in the, uh, when I was mentioning cross-compilation to WebAssembly because that's the default mode uh, when the compiler is not available. So, um, and that is supposed to work on most platforms that are supported by Go because that doesn't generate any fancy native code. It's just Go code. Uh, but Wazero also implements an ahead-of-time, low-time, single-pass, non-optimizing compiler for WebAssembly that supports MD64 and IRM64. So if you're on, or any, on any of those platforms, and uh, we're also testing on a major oper uh, operating system, which means Mac OS, Linux, Windows. If you are on those platforms, we switch automatically to this, uh, this compiler. So this is a bunch of words because I wanted to be pedantic. The, the reason I'm saying it's a low time, ahead of time compiler is that uh, this is the way it works. You load your WebAssembly module. The module is immediately compiled at that time. And then at runtime, you can instantiate it several times, as many times as you want. It won't be recompiled. So some people will say, this is still a just-in-time compiler. I just want to be pedantic. It does the compilation in a separate phase from runtime. While for a just-in-time compiler, I would expect to be there some tracing or at least some specialization at runtime. We're not doing that. Um, so if you're familiar with V8, uh, V8's architecture, there's liftoff, which is the fastest single-pass compiler. This is similar to what we do. And then there's, um, there's um, TurboFun, which is an optimizing compiler. So our current compiler is more similar to uh, Liftoff than it is to TurboFun. But the cool thing is that, the cool news is that we're working on an optimizing compiler, multi-pass optimizing compiler, and uh, it's showing promising results. Results, um, the V1 spec is already sort of passing. So the test case is at least of passing. Uh, so that's pretty cool. So, um, if you're familiar with WebAssembly, you will be familiar with those functions when you want to provide features and, and, and functions to call uh, in your host language. You will write your function using your host language. If you're in the browser, you will use JavaScript. If you're using Rust, it will be Rust. If you're using Web, um, Go, well, it will be, guess what? 
So um, this is the way you do it. The code is pretty much the same length. Uh, at the bottom, it looks a little bit longer because we're also instantiating the runtime, but it's pretty much the same stuff. So in this case, we're, we, I am providing a dot function, not very fancy, they're just summing to number. And this is the diagram of how it sort of work inside, inside, um, um, inside with zero. So you have your runtime, you provide to the runtime this host module, and the host module is just uh, uh, the zero way to define a collection of Go functions that you want it to be able to invoke from WebAssembly. And then at runtime, if the signatures and the names match, uh, you will be able to invoke them. So here I'm expecting some function called my host uh, dot add to be available, and this is being provided by my host module, which is written in Go, and everything will work. But how does this work under the hood? Okay, so I already mentioned there's a compile time and there's a run time, so let's see how the runtime works. So each WASM function is compiled to basically a slice of bytes, an array of bytes, and then this is, this is M mapped into memory, and then what pretty much happens is that we jump into the, the, the execution of that byte array, and those are just CPU instructions that will be executed by the CPU. Now, that's okay, and that will be executed until, until we have to leave that, that, that function and return. Now, what happens if there is an host function call or, or a trap that is an error or some uh, erratic situation? So traps and host function are invoked by, by, by a trampoline. So what does, mean, does that mean? Um, well, that means that basically we have to uh, play a little bit with the stack to make sure that everything aligns and you can invoke uh, uh, the stuff and uh, make sure that everything is aligned the right way. So when you instantiate a model, for instance, um, in an exec native function is, uh, is being invoked under the hood on the go space, and we set up the uh, registers and the stack in such a way that then we can jump into the execution of the start function, in this case, that's defined in the WebAssembly space, that's being compiled. Then we execute the function, and suppose that at some point there is an error, there's a trap, so we just leave execution by doing a clean exit from that, that, that function, uh, but uh, we return an exit code. And that exit code in the Go space is being analyzed, is being uh, matched against the list, and basically what we do in, in that case is panicking, that is throwing an error, run, throwing an exception, whatever. So, and that's how uh, execution terminates. Now, suppose you are actually um, not panicking, but you want to execute one particular function. The cool thing is it's pretty much the same. Um, so we still we still wanna we still wanna exit execution at some point. So instead of just leaving execution with an error code, we still leave with some exit code. But the exit code this time contains an identifier for a function that we wanna that we wanna invoke. So on the stack will be the arguments of the function uh, that we wanna invoke. Uh, there will also be the exit code, and the exit code is actually pointing to some function. We find a function in the Go space, so we're back jumping back here, and uh, we invoke the function with the right arguments that we uh, massage from the stack. We, re we get the results, we push them back the result to the, to the stack, and then we jump back this time to the execution of the native code. So we resume execution. And so that's pretty much the difference between panicking and execution uh, of, a, of a nose function. That's pretty cool, and that's how it works. So, What's the lesson that we learned by developing uh, with zero? I mean, this, this, these are my opinion, my personal opinion. So I think these are the lessons we have, we, that we learned. So the WebAssembly space is uh, a moving target. We know it. Uh, there's a lot of cool stuff happening here. We are learning a lot of bunch of uh, interesting uh, proposals. Uh, but our team is not huge, so we have to deal with, you know, being, being conservative versus bleeding edge. We have to choose. So what, how do we do it? Well, first of all, we have a Doral test base. We have a lot of, we pass the compiler, obviously. We have our own test suite uh, for the standard library and for, um, obviously, the compiler. Um, we test against the core spec, and this is, these are tests that we do every single time a PR, a PR is being opened, so every time. Um, we also test, again, the standard libraries of some languages. Uh, the Go standard library, the Zig standard library, they're compiling to WebAssembly, and we run all of the tests against our, our WebAssembly runtime to make sure that we're not breaking anything. And then we also test against TinyGo and Go uh, in its JS flavor, which is still compiling a special flavor of WebAssembly. We also I think we also have tests against uh, the M script and flavor of, of WebAssembly. So we're pretty 
covering. And of course, there's WASI test suite. We also run that. Um, other things that we do. We try to be conservative, so we do not implement specs that are not uh, fairly advanced in their stage of, of, of adoption. So, uh, rule of thumb, phase four. Uh, it has happened. Uh, I think we, it has happened that we adopted phase three, uh, but that's the rule of thumb. We're, for instance, eagerly awaiting for the threading, threading to stabilize because that's also really important for Go developers in the in the Go guest side for the Go compiler to compile WebAssembly. Um, and, uh, and we want to be user-driven when it comes to implementing stuff. We don't, we're not implementing stuff just for the sake of it. We want to have use cases. That's just uh, our approach. We tend to have that approach. Um, and, and also, when there are APIs that we do not support or we cannot support or we don't want to support, uh, be sure to check the rational.md document because we, all, we always document the reasons. So there are usually well-defined uh, reasons why something is not implemented or it is implemented the way it is. So we try to be uh, um, very, very structured that way. Other compatibility concerns. Um, well, we try to keep the coupling with, with the code very low. So for instance, we try to find the right abstraction, like right balance, well, typical you know, engineering, uh, engineering strategies and uh, good, good practices. Um, we take backwards compatibility very seriously. We released uh, uh, Wazero 1.0 this March, and that's a promise that we did to our end user not to break their user space. And we strive to be as cross-platform as possible. As I already mentioned, uh, we test against all major platforms, especially we try to test also against Windows, and Windows is a primary target. So even if it's sometimes a pain, uh, because some APIs, for instance, in YZ, pull one off, it's kind of a pain because Windows I.O., uh, does not really work the way, it's not really compatible with POSIX like non blocking IO, and that's because it's an asynchronous kind of IO, but it's not in working in the same, exactly the same way as non blocking uh, POSIX APIs. An interesting, uh, the, 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 you don't have to read all of this, um, but this is an interesting blog post from Matthew Garrett. Um, Matthew Garrett is a Linux kernel engineer. And uh, in this blog post, very recent blog post, last week, I think, um, he, he mentioned that his, uh, for a living, he's doing also support of POSIX APIs on Windows, and he's mentioned how painful it is to do that. And an interesting blog post, fairly, fairly short, so uh, you can check it out. So takeaways. Uh, be mindful of other platforms and other languages. There are many languages out there, and we want WebAssembly to succeed to support all of these languages, both as a guest and as a host. And uh, be mindful of operating systems and think about your end users. And this has been tried before in a way. Um, um, and I'm not just mentioning Java. Uh, I, I don't want to just talk about only Java. There's a history. But as a Java developer myself, uh, that's the history I'm most familiar with. So my Java, my, my uh, fellow Java developers are always like going like, uh, oh, yeah, WebAssembly, we know that. We've been doing that for quite a while, you know, and it didn't really work uh, on, the, on, the, on the client. We, well, what's new with that? Um, but I don't want to talk about the JVM, only the JVM. I want to talk about this project called GraalVM. I don't know if you're, if you're, you're familiar with it. Um, it sits kind of top of the Hotspot VM. It's, uh, it implemented JIT compiler, different JIT compiler from the Hotspot VM. But there's also these layers because they're, it's an umbrella of projects. And um, under the, this same umbrella, there is also polyglot programming. It supports a wide variety of, of languages, Ruby, R, JS, Python. And, uh, and even C++ and C, and even Rust through this basically an LLVM fast interpreter for, for LLVM IR. Um, and, and it's being used uh, in the wild. They're also using it inside, I think, Oracle database. But uh, that's not its most famous use case. Uh, in, fact, that's, in fact, Java developers are like, oh, this is GraalVM then. In fact, one of the most famous papers is one VM to rule them all, uh, because the holy grail was also polyglot programming. So what I'm trying to, what's the point I'm trying to make here? Well, the point I'm trying to make here is the most mainstream part of GraalVM was not something that were, they were designing for, which is native image. That is a compiler, um, uh, a compiler that compiles to native code your bytecode. And that's because people did not really embrace for uh, polyglot programming on that platform. You can think of native image as an hybrid between wiser and, uh, and, and, and an actual native compiler, because it's also doing pre-initialization of, of the bytecode. And, um, 
There's a lot of things that we can also learn from their experience. For instance, you cannot really pre-initialize everything. Because if you pre-initialize, for instance, a random seed, well, that's the output that you're going to get. So, and you cannot really be sure about random, you know. But <laughs> so uh, the, the point I'm trying to make as a maintainer, things are moving fast, but you don't have to get burned out. Uh, things are moving fast, but adoption will still take a while. So you can still uh, make choices. And as a community, think of your use cases, think of the use case you want to enable, think of your end users, and of course, be nice to your friendly maintainers. Thank you. Uh, of course, if you want, you can give us a star, and these are all the references that we have. Uh, if you want to chat with us, we are on the Gopher Slack. We hang out, all of us, uh, most of us uh, hang here. And that's it, that's all I have. I don't know if I have some time for questions. We do. Okay, good. Uh, so, yeah, we have a few, uh, few minutes. There's a question there from a maintainer. <laughs> Okay, so the question is, if you're curious about Wazero, what would be the best way to start, um, you know, playing with it or contribute? Well, well, there are many ways, as usual, with open source software. Uh, we're, first of all, using it. <laughs> the best way to start contributing. Uh, if you find a bug, uh, you can open an issue or, and, or you can join the Slack and, and just ask us. Um, yeah, and um, you can contribute I don't know, documentation, maybe. Well, we're pretty good with that. So uh, you can try it. That's, that's the best way to do it. Um, if you want to scratch an itch, uh, there's some features that you would like to see, you can propose it, and potentially you can implement it. Like uh, we have a contributor that's working on supporting and scripting, and they are doing it, and they're contributing that code, and they suggest uh, features to introduce inside the engine itself, and sometimes these are is uh, these are merged inside the core, so yeah. Oh, another way, if you're a user, you can contribute to the user's uh, uh, list of users, so that's another good way. Any other questions? Oh, by the way, the question from, was from uh, Ashil from Stealth Rocket. You should check out the stuff that they're doing, Timecraft and WZProf. I actually have a slide. Since we have time, I can show you the slide for that as well. Uh, it's a very cool profiler that sits on top of Wazero. I think I should have a slide for that. But anyway, um, check that out. Uh, it's, a, it's a profiler for your code and uh, integrates nicely with, uh, with TinyGo, uh, uh, with, um, with Go when it's compiled to WebAssembly. You can also inspect the stack, cool stuff. And you can also profile Python. This is recent, right? Yeah. Super cool. Oh, there it is. Um, any other questions? What, what blog post? Oh, okay, so the question was, when is the blog post coming out? So there's a blog, uh, there's a blog post that um, is gonna be published about uh, WebAssembly support uh, in, in Go proper, and the answer is Wednesday, they tell me. Okay, Wednesday. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, cool, I'll be around, uh, so just, uh, just, uh, just let's talk in the hallway if you'd like. And again, thank you. <laughs>